of your questions. So a big thank you to everyone that has joined us today on this Tuesday morning and a big thank you to all of you that have supported so many of these iTuesday sessions. It's really fantastic for us to see so many of the same brokers and people from all around the country and internationally joining us. Um, so we really do appreciate the support and we hope that today is going to give you another great session and insights from one of our experts. Um, Joe van Rensburg, if I could just ask you to turn your video off if possible. And that would be great. Thank you. If everyone could turn their videos and microphones off. So let's get going. So, so one of the things that, that we at I2 want to be famous for is that we want to be experts in everything we do. And that's different lines of specialty insurance. And James Bryce is certainly one of those people that is an expert. James is an expert in the area of environmental liability and actually even more than that. So James is going to be talking to you today. He's going to give you a very brief overview of some of our products in environmental liability and the insurance products we do for the trucking industry, mining industries, fuel, fuel industries, and other large industrial risks. Um, and we'd really like to encourage some of our brokers to give us some support. We have a team uh, behind James that is, are really experts in what we do. And we know that this is not always a line of business that is important um, to all of your clients, particularly in tough financial times. But we do think that it's important cover, and we do have a team of experts that are really able to sit with our brokers and clients and tailor solutions for your businesses. So James is going to give us a brief overview of um, our products in environmental liability. And then most of his talk today, he's going to be talking about you know, the responsive nature to this lockdown. And I'm sure many of you have seen some of the articles around the world of how nature has responded. I think some of it has been fake news. Um, but some of it has certainly been interesting, and today we're going to hear from our expert, James Bryce, uh, a little bit about how nature has responded to lockdown. So we're going to have a great session. Please message us questions on the group, and please support us in some of these lines of business. We will put James's contact details on the WhatsApp group if you want to get hold of him for quotes and business. Um, but let's hand it over to you, to you, James, and thank you for your time today, everyone. And could I just ask um, Dulcy, I think, if you could turn your camera off, if possible. Thank you very much. Okay, James, you can share your presentation and let's get going. Thank you very much, Justin, and good morning, everybody. A little daunting talking to 300 people when I can't see you. Um, pity we can't meet in person, but um, I'm sure soon enough that'll happen. Um, Anyway, I'm glad you all managed to get back from tops in time this morning to, to uh, join us. Um, and um, yeah, uh, what I wanted to talk about and what we were thinking about was what might be interesting is how nature has responded during this um, lockdown period. Um, we've done a sort of a synopsis. What we're going to share with you is a synopsis of the research that's available on the internet. Um, unfortunately, there's not much available from South Africa. Um, just we just don't have the data systems and that they do elsewhere in the world. So we're going to share with you what we what we're <clears> observing um, from the research that's out there about how the planet has responded with the um, decrease in human activity. Um, and obviously, this is linked to our to our ERL products, which I'll touch on at the end, and why this is important. Um, you know, environmental impairment, liability, um, particularly with regards to some of the more um, gradual and pervasive issues, such as, you know, groundwater pollution, air pollution, um, soil contamination over time. These, these are all designed to provide financial facilities to protect the environment in the event of any pollution incident. So we thought it might be useful and, and, and um, reflective for us to consider why the planet is worth saving in the end. Um, I mean, obviously, we depend on it for everything we have, but sometimes we take that for granted as we live in our cities and our, our insulated bubbles of life. Um, so, you know, how does nature remind us of, of how we coexist? So we've prepared this presentation. Um, 
it's the first time we're doing it, so please bear with us if there are any hiccups. Um, and let me know um, if you can see the slides okay. Uh, Justin, do you just want to confirm if you can uh, see that all right? Yeah, James, that's looking great. That's perfect, and you're looking and sounding great. So thank you. Just talking. Sorry, mate. Um, maybe I need to... Sorry, Justin, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. We can uh, hear you perfectly and the screens look perfect. So you're good to go. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So this is a, um, a synopsis, as I said. And we're going to kick off first with the macro changes. So, um, you know, nature's built on systems, systems and balance. Um, from you know energy balances to carbon balances, sulfur balance, water balance, and how these you know delicate balances um, have been allowed to reestablish themselves. Let's kick off with the first big macro issue um, affecting the future of the planet, and that is um, climate change. Um, I mean, it's a theory still that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases affect. Um, surface temperatures and the ability of the atmosphere to retain energy. Um, and obviously carbon dioxide emissions are linked to human activity. Um, carbon dioxide is obviously a naturally occurring gas. You know, it's produced en masse by um, um, plants at night, uh, volcanoes, natural fires. So it's a natural part of, of, of the Earth's process, but um, we're increasing the levels of, of um, carbon dioxide from 400 ppm to about 625 ppm parts per million. And the theory is that obviously this is acting like a, a blanket over the planet's atmosphere, um, trapping uh, the sun's radiation more than other gases should. So from a carbon dioxide emission point of view, um, we are the only species that taps into natural reserves, such as oil deposits that have been sitting trapped in the ground for millions of years. And we release this at very high rates into the atmosphere, and obviously that affects how the climate is, is uh, responding. Um, what we found during the lockdown with um, the rapid decrease in urban activity and industrial activity is that as a planet, our carbon dioxide emissions have been reduced by about 26% over, over this period. Um, that's massive. Um, the, um, the, uh, you know, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accord, the thing that Trump pulled America out of, um, is trying to achieve carbon emissions back to 1990 levels. So getting us back to the same levels of emissions that we had in 1990 as a as a planet, um, that um, is equivalent to about a seven to ten percent reduction in emissions on a sustainable level, based on what we have now. So we see that you know that the lockdown has been extremely effective, um, and it's just you know interesting to understand what changed in society to bring about that effect. Um, so, and it's not just carbon dioxide emissions, they're all other types of gases that come from our industrial activity. So carbon monoxide, as you probably know, is a poisonous gas also that is a result of incomplete combustion. Um, New York City, for example, experienced a 50% reduction in carbon monoxide. Um, they had 40% less domestic and air traffic and a 41% decrease in peak traffic con congestion. In, um, in Europe, um, there were 67 million fewer air passengers um, over this period. I mean, that's a phenomenal amount. Um, the decrease in nitrogen, in, in nitrogen dioxide, NO2, which is also a byproduct of burning air, which is, as you know, 70% um, 79% nitrogen. Um, when nitrogen reacts with oxygen and forms NO2, um, which gives you your that that 
that brown haze, that smog over cities, um, that um, has been reduced by, for example, 75% in places like Madrid and, and 10% in northern Italy. Um, so significant reductions in not just greenhouse gas emissions, but other types of um, air pollution too. This map has become a little famous um, around the NO2 uh, levels over Beijing and, and, and northeastern China. You can see Wuhan there in the map as well, um, where this all started. Um, and I, I've personally been to Beijing and the air pollution is, is, is terrible. I mean, any of you who've been there know that they've been wearing masks there for a long time, not because of coronavirus, but because of the severe levels of, of air pollution. And you can just see from these satellite photos how, how clear the air was in just one month of reduced activity. Um, of course, it's starting to reestablish itself, and we'll talk about that now. But um, China's emissions, we believe, in total over this period were reduced by about 25% across all different types of gases. And just the effect of the air quality on human health um, is, is, is significant. Um, and, and the effect on human life um, is quite pronounced. Um, so pre-pandemic, the CO2 emissions are rising at about 1% a year. And by early April, the daily global CO2 emissions decreased by about 17%. Uh, the reasons for these changes, obviously, a forced reduction in energy demand, largely as a result of travel and industrial activities and shutdowns in the factories. Um, the fact that, you know, this crisis is very different to other crises that have happened in terms of forced behavioral changes um, amongst all of us. Um, but the effects are going to be short-lived unless there's structural changes in the way that we operate. And, and the biggest, you know, without a doubt, the biggest sort of structural change that needs to happen in society to maintain these types of reduced pollution levels is in our supply chain effects. Globalization is the, is the, 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 you know, the main cause of the rapid spread of the virus. It's also the main cause of our you know, baseline level of pollution, you know, transporting goods around the world on a continuous basis um, is obviously great for, for um, just-in-time manufacturing, but not very good for, for managing our carbon emissions. I, um, during the lockdown, I managed to quick sneak out to the, to, to the beach, didn't walk on the beach, <laughs> just in case anybody wants to report me. Um, but I took the kids down just to have a look at the sea um, from one of the parking lots. And it was at uh, Milnerton. Um, those of you that know, that know Cape Town, and Milnerton Beach obviously looks out over to Table Bay and Table Mountain, beautiful view in Robben Island. And Table Bay was just packed full of shipping vessels, just loaded with shipping containers, all just waiting to come into port. I must have counted 20, 30 ships. You know, normally you see three, four, five. Um, you know, it just gives you the, an idea of these ships have traveled, you know, they're just traveling around the world all the time. We'll talk later about noise levels in the oceans um, and how that affects sea life. Um, but the supply chain issue is, is a big one. Um, you know, we've seen companies resort to things like 3D printing to try and substitute um, their suppliers um, or shifting their supply chain base to more domestic suppliers as opposed to importing from especially China. Um, but, you know, I think the tendency will be that people will revert back to prior, you know, prior supply chain. So we'll probably expect that these air emissions and carbon emissions uh, benefits during the lockdown are going to be um, short-lived and returned to normal, unfortunately. Um, let me see. Here we are. Okay. So let's just look at, for example, air flights. And I'm sure you've, you've, you've all noticed um, a lack of airplane traffic. 
um, overhead. Um, unfortunately, where I live in Cape Town, I'm in the flight path to um, Esterplatte, the, the military air force base here. Um, and there have been some interesting activities with the president's fly plane flying in and army planes. But from commercial flights point of view, um, pretty much ground to a halt. This, if you ever, I don't know if, 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 if you're aware of this website, you go into flight, flight radar 24, you can track all the flights in the air at any given time. It's, it's fascinating. My kids love it. And you can literally track each flight, see what type of airplane it is, where is it flying to, et cetera. And the only flights that really carried on um, um, over the period of the lockdown were, were air cargo. And you can see um, in this graphic the, um, the tremendous um, uh, reduction in number of flights um, flying each day. So, I mean, this is a phenomenal number. So, we, you know, normally we're running at close to 175,000 flights a day as a planet, you know, and that's literally was reduced by a third um, and is slowly picking its way up again. Um, these are uh, interesting uh, snapshots, screen, screen captures from, from flight radar um, on the 7th of March. This is, I mean, this is still 7th of March. You can see the types of activities. Each of these yellow dots is a, a plane in the air at, even, at any given time, and this is normal. You know, you can't normally see America for planes. You have to zoom in really close to even see any land. The number of flights in America is outstanding. Is outstanding, and I mean, look at the look at the North Atlantic travel there, um, and Europe's the same, going all the way down over India and then to China. Um, the uh, this should be seventh of April, sorry, on that date there, and you can see the reduction. Obviously, the states were slow to catch up, um, and, 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 and yes, there's been massive effect on the airplane industry in the U.S. as well. But they didn't shut down nearly as strictly as we did. And you can see the types of reductions in flight activity over South Africa and Africa. And um, This is a close-up shot of Europe. I mean, just look at the number of flights at any given time. And this was 7th of March. I happened to be in Germany around late February. Um, when there were only 14 cases in Germany. Um, so this was around about that time, and there was still a flurry of activity. Um, and then if you look at April, you can see how the skies were just completely empty. Um, <clears throat> and almost all of these are cargo flights. Um, yeah, the, the, the monthly decrease is, is a significant one. Um, and, and very interesting to look at. Uh, Justin, I'm not sure how we're handling any questions. I can't hear anything. Um, so James, I think, um, tell people that if, they, if you have questions, put them on the um, message group if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. And then we can, I can, I'll, I'll interrupt you and ask them if anyone has questions or we can deal with them at the end. But your presentation okay. is really interesting so far. Um, and I'm sure we'll, if, so if you do have questions, anyone, put them on the message and we'll make sure that we ask them to James. Thanks, James. Yeah, it's just that I, you know, I've got the presentation on, so I can't, I can't keep the two screens going. So if anyone's got questions, just please just jump in there. Huh? Sure, I will do. Okay. So unfortunately, um, the... The lockdown itself is, 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 is hardly making a dent in terms of our, our, um, our global emissions over time because we're going to rapidly reestablish um, the baseline that, happened, you know, that was present before the lockdown. Um, and comparing this decline that we've seen now, we need a, roughly a 10% drop every year on a sustainable basis to, you know, achieve our, our carbon emission goals. Um, but the lockdown shows the radical measures that we need to take to be able to achieve um, this kind of, these, 
these kinds of results. Um, unfortunately, there um, the uh, the lockdown also had a negative effect in the sense of um, renewable energy was rapidly expanding around the world, and but those projects have also been put on hold. So there's you know a double there's both sides to that equation in terms of how we are repositioning ourselves um, as a society to um, reduce our emissions. Um, so unfortunately, our individual actions and um, very sort of micro level effects are not, are not going to result in the macro level um, benefits that the planet really needs. And a systematic transformation in, in our transport systems. Um, you know, there's a, there's a term in Scandinavia called skamflucht, very similar to the Afrikaans, flight shaming, skamflucht, where, you know, you, you, you're seeing like Greta Thunberg, um, you know, sailing from America to Europe by a boat, etc., or, or, or preferring to use trains. Um, and from an energy efficiency point of view, you know, Airplanes are very inefficient, and shipping and trains, for example, are much more efficient forms of transport. Um, but the concept now in Scandinavia is that it's it's really not cool to fly unless you really, really have to. And you know, hopefully, um, the lockdown will will result in in people really rethinking, you know, things like business flights, so business class flights, or you know, flying across the world for a conference for one day um, and then flying back home. I mean, people do that all the time. I'm sure many of you have taken, you know, flights to London for a single meeting. Um, that, you know, that was the norm. Um, and I, you know, the debates in the environmental circles was, you know, whether, whether the lockdown is going to expedite or almost entrench this resistance to sort of, gratuitous travel, uh, particularly with the rise of um, the types of webinar platforms that we're speaking on now. Um, you know, will they substitute the need for human contact in meetings, etc.? cetera? Um, any of you that are invested on the stock markets in the US will know how the share price of Zoom has shot up, literally. I mean, they were up 8% again yesterday. Um, you know, once they got their security measures sorted out. So, you know, have we fundamentally changed the way we interact as society? Um, certainly those of us who can afford or need to travel around the world. Um, you know, is that a thing of the past? Uh, will people choose to have more domestic holidays as opposed to like how we got COVID in the first place in South Africa, fly to Italy for a skiing holiday? Um, why not go to Lesotho instead for your skiing holiday? So anyway, these are, you know, these are questions that we as society need to start asking is, is you know, where can we learn from, from the lockdown? On a more sobering topic um, around animal and habitats, I know there's, you know, and we'll get onto the stories of, you know, dolphins in the Thames and things like that, that, that have made headlines, but there is a, uh, sort of other side of the story as well is that um, unfortunately during the lockdown period there's been an increase in dependence on poaching and logging and other activities you know whereas we worry about flying across the world you know 70 percent of society 80 percent of society is still very worried about very very basic issues such as water supply and very importantly hunger um, there's been a rapid increase in dependency on bushmeat. Um, and people are killing, you know, wildlife, not just for horns and tusks, but to eat. Um, you know, living off what they can catch in rivers. Um, and there's an interesting relationship between climate change and the outbreak of these types of diseases. In fact, it's not the first time that this has happened. Um, you know, the theory coming out of Wuhan is obviously that it's linked to the wet markets and the proximity of people living close to the animals that they eat. Um, 
and eating more and more exotic species, such as the pangolin, you know, we might um, find this very strange. But in China, they literally eat everything. Um, only a month ago did they declassify cats and dogs from being livestock to being pets. Uh, it, it's, it's bizarre to think of it, but, you know, that's, that's the norm there. Um, so, you know, eating bats and pangolins and other, um, you know, zootic um, uh, um, carrying bacteria that can jump from animals to humans um, also occurred during the Ebola outbreak. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa coincided with um, with um, uh, a very dry season. Very, you know, there was a, there was a drought in West Africa, in in uh, Guinea and these uh, Liberia and these other countries, and people started hunting further and further into the forest and started eating different types of species that they wouldn't normally have eaten, including bats, and that's really. The theory goes that that's where the Ebola outbreak started. And there's a direct linkage between climate change and that. And, you know, the same thing now with uh, Wuhan. So, you know, as a society, we've, we've, we've not only got to protect our endangered species, but we've also got to protect ourselves as society from eating things that might carry bugs that will have a deleterious effect on us in the long term. Um, you know, the... the um, the challenge also, besides just eating um, other species, is, is, is on the poaching. Um, so smuggled rhino horns, pangolin scales, gallbladders, reptiles, turtles, um, you know, goes on. And I, in April, a South African was tried and jailed in Singapore for attempting to smuggle 11 rhino horns. Um, on 9th March, pangolin scale smugglers were arrested. Um, for bringing in life, were arrested in China, in Gangzhou, for bringing in reptiles and turtles. Um, 441 kilograms of pangolin scales and gallbladders. And you just wonder what, you know, what will people use this for? I don't think we go, you know, want to get into those, into those uh, details. Um, but this is going on, um, lockdown or no lockdown. Um, and then, you know, we'll touch on, on, on some of the issues. There was a lot of fake news. There weren't dolphins in Venice canals. Um, and while Turkey's returning to California, et cetera, um, what, what we did, however, see was, was isolated incidents of animals enjoying more, more freedom um, as our human activity decreased. So pumas in Chile, in Santiago, in the middle of the city, you know, puma sightings extremely rare. Um, you saw deer wandering uh, through the subway stations in Japan, um, mountain goats descending into Wales. Um, you know, we also saw locust outbreaks, uh, one in the Karoo. I don't know if you're aware, but we had a massive locust outbreak in the Karoo um, over the last couple of months, not only just in Kenya. Um, Penguins found wandering the streets of Simonstown. Um, in the UK, the roadkill um, is bizarre. Um, normally, um, in the UK, the roadkill is a bit of a coinage. Over 100,000 hedgehogs, 100,000 foxes, 50,000 badgers, and 30,000 deer a year are killed in the UK on the roads. Those are phenomenal numbers. Um, 100,000 hedgehogs. So, 100,000 foxes, it, you know, and that's really ground to a halt as it, with the decrease in the traffic. So, hopefully, these species will be emboldened and, and um, will uh, benefit. On the ocean side, um, you know, industrial shipping has made the ocean an increasingly noisy place. And as we know, with whales and dolphins, you know, sound travels underwater, and these are very sensitive animals that um, depend on... Um, sound to communicate and to navigate. Um, as a result of our lockdown, the world's oceans are the quietest that they've been for over 150 years. 
And this is, again, not the first time that this has happened. After 9-11, um, scientists monitored the stress levels of whales by analyzing their droppings. Interesting way of measuring stress. Um, and found that the whales that they had been studying were at their lowest stress levels ever recorded up to that point as a result of the decrease in shipping um, and the noise in the oceans after 9-11. You know, the, the, the reduction in, in seagoing traffic um, in a lockdown scenario far exceeds that of 9-11, obviously. Um, and the ocean has responded by some very unusual sightings. Um, the, um, the, uh, in the Middle East, um, they've, in, they've, ex they've observed pods of dolphins over 2,000 members strong, so over 2,000 dolphins swimming together, including sightings of extremely rare um, albino dolphins, um, white dolphins. Um, you know, rays, sharks, dolphins um, starting to be observed. Um, superpod of sperm whales outside Sri Lanka, over 350 sperm whales together in a pod. I mean, this, isn't, this hasn't been seen for, for decades. Um, and off the coast of Thailand, sightings of the um, very shy and endangered dugongs um, who are starting to come out um, and, and, and reestablish um, old breeding grounds. So um, a very positive sign coming out of the oceans. Of course, um, we'll see how long that lasts. I'm sure all of you, I mean, in fact, I heard some of your microphones were on earlier, um, have experienced increased birdsong. Um, I'm just checking the questions. Oh, all the questions about CPD points. <laughs> okay. If anyone's got any questions about the presentation, you're more than welcome to ask. Um, but I could hear on people's um, microphones earlier some bird song in the background. And you know, unfortunately, we've also heard more hardy does. Um, but yeah, the bird song is definitely a lot more pronounced. Um, and engineering consultancies um, are picking up the same as, as the confidence of birds to re-establish themselves in urban environments um, grows. Um, in Guildford, just outside London, in the UK, for example, they've measured an eight decibel reduction in sound volumes. Eight decibels is significant. It's, um, it's the background level of what you experience just, you know, sitting normally um, uh, in, the, in, your, in your home environment. Um, that level of constant background noise has been eliminated largely from traffic and, and, and um, overhead flights, etc. cetera. Um, noise levels in Dublin, for example, have dropped by one third. Um, and ravens, for example, have re-entered the city, being able to communicate. Hits on birdwatch in Ireland, for example, are up by 350% as society started to take more notice of their natural environment. Um, insects are also recovering. Um, and hopefully this will have good news for the bees, um, who we know whose, whose numbers are under threat, um, especially with a reduction in um, maintenance activities, cutting of grasses on street verges, um, and explosions of color in terms of flowers. Um, roadside verges, for example, um, are refuges for, for over 700 species of wildflowers in the UK, for example, which is 45% of the UK's total plant community. Um, okay, so that's at a macro level, and then just moving down to uh, regional changes. Um, 
According to the World Health Organization, 91% of us as a species lives in area where the air quality lives in areas where the air quality exceeds permissible limits. Um, so if you look at PM 2.5 levels, PM 2.5 means particulate matter, uh, which is less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And that's the stuff that gets very deep into your lungs um, and causes, um, you know, the problems with your resp respiratory systems. Um, we've seen um, reductions in these levels. These pictures of Milan and Italy um, show you the types of, of contrasts that they were experiencing there. Um, this again is Venice. Um, the relationship between uh, particulate levels and air pollution levels in human health. Um, so a tiny increase in uh, particulate level associated to a 15% increase in the more in the death rate resulting from exposure to COVID-19. Um, and there's a very strong correlation in all the major areas of outbreak between air pollution and uh, the death rate ascribed to, to COVID-19. Um, um, for example, these are readings of Platykluf, um here in Cape Town um, on nitrous oxides um, and nitrogen oxides um, measured on a weekly basis. And you can see the rapid drop off um, pretty much down to zero um, as soon as the lockdown came into effect. Um, we see the same thing here. This is not, this is not Orange River, sorry, it's Orange Farm, um, just outside Joburg. And you can see the reduction there as well. Um, so we're seeing that on a localized level from our, our air pollution monitoring stations here in South Africa. From a, from a beach pollution point of view, um, yes, obviously a huge natural asset in coastal areas, um, possess a lot of intrinsic value, especially to the tourism industry, and they are fragile breeding grounds to um, in many spaces. Um, and notable changes being seen on the appearances of uh, many beaches. For example, plankton, uh, the bioluminescence here in Mexico, um, unseen for, for many years um, of the waves there. Um, and these were beaches that were previously unswimmable due to human waste runoff um, and are now um, being lit up for the first time in 60 years as people are being kept out of the water for nearly a month. So just showing again how quickly the seas reestablish their health. Um, um, our, our human oceans, sorry, not human oceans, our, our um, oceans are faced with many different types of threats. Um, and um, yeah, we've spoken a lot about that. Um, just, you know, pointing out that um, the reduction in fishing activity um, is, is important. 70% of the fish in the sea is, is uh, fully depleted um, or threatened. Um, you know, the um, reduction in fishing activity as a result of COVID-19 um, is expected also to give species a lot of time to recover. And we hope to see those numbers um, coming through in the next couple of months. And hopefully fishing, you know, trawlers will go back to the ocean and start to appreciate um, the, the uh, uh, replenished levels of stocks. Um, if we don't stop changing, if, if we don't change our fishing habits and our dependencies on the sea, um, we expect that the world's fisheries would have collapsed by 2048. And that's only, you know, 28 years away. Um, all right, in terms of rivers, um, the Ganges River, the most polluted river in the world, um, is within four weeks of shutdown, completely clean. 
clean waters were seen from the foothills of the Himalayas all the way through to the Indian Ocean in Calcutta. Um, the uh, beaches have also um, been re-established as breeding grounds. Um, for example, in Thailand, these, um, these leatherback turtles um, have built the most nests that they've seen in over 20 years on these deserted beaches. Um, they've seen the re-emergence of species such as this olive ridley sea turtle in India that is, hasn't been seen before. Um, and the stories just increase. Um, horseshoe crab recoveries in New Jersey, Malaysia, endangered otters uh, returning to the lakes in Malaysia. Um, you know, all these happy stories of how, you know, especially in the oceans, things are recovering very quickly. Um, and shark fin fishing, for example, um, Indonesia sharks, these are all shark fins here. 70% um, decrease in the demand of shark fins coming out of Indonesia. Um, and hopefully that will, that will retain. Looking to urban and industry changes, um, the oil industry um, obviously went through some very bizarre changes um, over this period due to the lack of demand for oil consumption. Um, Africa stopped exporting oil, affecting economies such as Angola and Nigeria. Um, Nigeria faces a 3% drop in oil revenue, and we see the price of oil actually drop to minus uh, 34, I think it was, or minus $40 at one point due to an oversupply and a, and a, and a, a shortage of storage capacity. Um, this obviously exacerbated by Saudi Arabia not signing up to the OPEC uh, restrictions and deciding to flood the market while they... Um, um, uh, continue their battles with the Russian-led dominance over Iran. And it's, you know, these kind of um, regional struggles are playing out. Um, the challenge, though, is the plunge in the oil prices might delay the benefits to um, any renewable energy programs, because obviously oil is so plentiful now. Um, we've, we saw a two-run a two rand a litre cut here in South Africa. Unfortunately, it's short-lived because of the exchange rate counteracting that. Um, but um, there's certainly going to be um, a reduction in investment in, in oil infrastructure. Um, we're expecting on a global level that capital expenditure on, on oil exploration and refining uh, to be reduced by about 30%. Um, over the past three months, 30 million barrels a day are pumped into storage and there's literally no more space to store um, uh, all this excessive supply when it's not matched by demand. Um, we're seeing a dial back on, um, on um, environmental regulations um, as companies struggle to survive. In China, they suspended environmental standards. Brazil has reduced surveillance there in the Amazon. Um, seabed mining legislation um, continues to move forward. So it's a mixed bag. At a municipal household level, um, recycling programs, unfortunately, have been put on hold uh, as officials are worried about the virus spreading in recycling centers. Um, Corporations have overturned disposable bag bans to allow single-use plastics again to prevent people from um, use, being exposed to contaminated uh, utensils or reusable plastics. Um, so, for example, restaurants are not, are not accepting uh, reusable cups again, uh, such as Starbucks. Um, and there's been an increase in online deliveries and purchases. I'm sure you're all um, exercising that at the moment while you work from home. Um, and unfortunately, that's also increased the amount of packaging 
plus medical waste coming out of the hospitals and clinics around the world. In America, for example, the surge of medical waste, it's expected to put 467,000 workers at risk as they're exposed to handling potentially contaminated waste. Wuhan produced over 200 tons of waste a day um, versus during the, the COVID outbreak versus just 50 tons before the COVID outbreak. So um, <coughs> we're seeing that with, with um, our policies on our trucking of, of medical waste, for example, that you know, we've extended our cover to, to, um, to include um, bodily injury from transportation of medical waste um, during the lockdown period. Something that you might not be aware of in South Africa is um, the oversupply of, of, of fuel into the market has been soaked up, but essentially all our refineries in South Africa um, have been shut down. Um, we're hoping that those will come back into production this week and next week, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are interruptions in terms of fuel supply locally here in South Africa. Um, most of the um, most of um, the local production, um, as you can see, was um, halted, um, and we expect that to be rationed going forward. Um, and then, just something on the social side um, is gender parity. Um, you know, besides environmental issues, how this lockdown has affected societies. We've seen a rise in gender-based violence over 500% since the start of the lockdown. You know, working mothers are interrupted much more than fathers during the lockdown. I'm sure you've all experienced with your homeschooling, and um, living with your kids day in and day out. Um, the gender-based violence, as we know, increases during every type of emergency. Um, and Unfortunately, it also uh, manifests by, um, here in South Africa, 34% of people going to bed hungry during the lockdown. Shock to household incomes, um, and as opposed to a shock to food availability, and farmers being forced to throw away harvests due to the absence of the effective supply chains um, and lower demand. Plus, farmers are being turned away at borders trying to get their products um, across, you know, into breaching their markets. So, you know, we've tried, with this, we've tried to cover um, an overview as to, you know, some of the global effects um, and local as a result of the lockdown and, and, and how the planet is responding. Um, don't know, let me just have a look here. If there are any questions, Justin? Yeah, Jan, 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 there are quite a there few questions, questions. Um, which I can call to you if you want. Um, do you want to give, I think everyone may be interested in a brief overview of your products. Do you want to do that and then we can take questions or do you want to, maybe let's give a quick overview of your products if you, if you want to, and then we can take a couple of questions because there are quite a few good questions coming into the, the message group. Yeah, I mean, very simply, in terms of our products, what, what we're designing is obviously um, we're the first underwriter on the continent that can do gradual and pre-existing pollution. Um, and our challenge is that the GL policies obviously cover sudden and accidental only. And it's very difficult to prove the occurrence of pollution unless it's very dramatic. Um, as you can see from the nature's responses, you know, climate change, water, oceans, um, nature's effects take, take time to heal. Um, and it's, it's the, you know, the big sudden and accidental events are easy to locate. It's the more pernicious effects, the, the dripping tank underground, which is very difficult to prove the occurrence and um, much more expensive to clean up. From a gradual pollution point of view, for every year that you leave something in the soil, it's 10 times more expensive to clean up because it just spreads so much further, it's so much more dilute, and it affects so many potential claimants because everybody lives downstream, right? 
whatever we put into the world's oceans and air ends up on our plate in the long term. Um, and we're all connected. So as nature spreads pollutants, it just gets you know, exponentially more expensive to clean up. Plus, a lot of Africa's infrastructure is old. It's, it's not maintained. It's not performing the way it should. Um, we have uncertain regulations. Well, we've got very good regulations, very uncertain enforcement. We've got an absence of, of case law establishing precedents for claims around gradual pollution. Um, we have a very active NGO and media that's very quick to jump on your corporate clients and make them look like the bad guys in any pollution issues. Um, and all foreign investors and banks have to abide by these international environmental and standards. And we expect that COVID and that is just going to increase the level of focus on these environmental issues globally. Um, you know, so what do we cover when it, I'll give you <clears throat> a quick overview of our products here. So we have a trucking product that covers goods in transit um, during any accidents or spills during transport. We have a tank safe product, which is covers underground storage tanks and um, your vanilla type of industrial activities wherever there's sumps or tanks or um, concentrated storage of hazardous materials like factories and warehouses and filling stations etc our site safe product is for our more complex facilities such as you know pipelines airports chemical plants refineries etc we have prop safe which covers the transfer of um, potentially contaminated land in an m a type of scenario um, then we, divide, we design BankSafe, um, which is, if any of you've got any banking or investor clients, uh, including um, uh, property companies, um, where we can cover a portfolio of properties or exposure to lenders and providers of capital and investors across their, port, their portfolio of assets. And then we are offering um, the first mining treaty, which doesn't exclude coal, because we believe that the coal miners, you know, even if we didn't buy another electron produced by Eskom, um, these coal mines are still going to leave a legacy that could affect third parties um, over the next 20 to 30 years as we gradually wean ourselves off our coal dependency. And we've all you know, benefited from the electrons produced from coal in the past. So now is not the time to desert our, our coal miners, nor do we want coal miners passing any more costs into Eskom, and we know what a predicament they're under. So we will manage to secure reinsurance capacity to provide um, um, a full suite of, of, of mining environmental um, covers um, without having to exclude coal. Uh, our limits are up to 65 million each and every annual ags 175 fat cover can be procured obviously um, and i think that gives a very quick synopsis of of our comprehensive suite of products so let's see if there's any questions just um great stuff james and and thank you so much for a really different and interesting talk uh, we can always judge by the number of people that are on the talk and the number of people that are leaving and, and we've had well over 200 people that stayed on. So, so James, really interesting talk and thank you so, to, so much. I think you certainly live up to the name or the reputation of, of an expert in what you do. So James, I mean, maybe just a couple of questions. I mean, the one thing that you've always spoken about so nicely for me is, is you know, the need, um, this is not only about the liability and the cost, but the need to actually buy this co this cover because it is it is kind of the right thing to do um, for business and I think you touched on it that I think businesses are going to become more aware after COVID. So what are your what are your what are your views on the trends around legislation and governance around the need for envi environmental liability insurance after COVID? <coughs> actually, just if I could maybe just go back to I think what's a really interesting question here. I know. Anna Guerrero Wilson, yes. I'll stick to Wilson. Anna Wilson, um, I'm not sure where you're from, Anna, um, but you ask a very interesting question here. You said somewhere in your presentation you showed that an individual participation in trying to reduce the climate change will have no effect. It's very discouraging. I thought a little goes a long way. 
I'm sure everyone is keenly interested in our beautiful planet and wants to help in any way possible where they can. Yeah, um, you know, I've been an environmental consultant and activist for 25, 30 years. And I, it's, it's kind of disheartening when I see my mom packing her plastic packaging in her plastic bricks. You know, she takes a two liter Coke bottle and she stuffs it full of plastic bottles and she's doing a bit to save the planet. And, you know, when you see the kind of institutional damage that's being done by corporates, um, it, our individual activities do pale into insignificance, unfortunately. And it, the types of environmental issues that I'm sure the people that are sitting on this call, we're, we've got first world problems and we're living with third world realities, um, unfortunately. And until the financial markets start to build in you know, the, the costs and benefits of, of, of managing our environmental and our planetary legacy into a return on investment, um, we're not going to see the types of macro changes that we really need to see in society. You know, it's when the billions of dollars that are sloshing around the world looking for returns on investment start to factor these things in on a very fundamental level. I mean, I'll give an example. So the whole... The whole um, Kyoto Protocol around climate change and the, what's called clean development mechanisms um, attached a price to carbon, a ton of carbon. And the idea was that if a country in Europe, let's say Norway, couldn't achieve their carbon targets, they could sponsor projects here in Africa um, through this clean development mechanism to deliver the carbon savings and they could claim it for their own. So it was a great mechanism for how to finance um, uh, cleaner production around the world. But America didn't sign up to it. So the demand on the carbon pricing was lost. The bottom fell out the price of the carbon market. China was oversupplying the market. And then we had the bizarre scenario of the Scandinavian countries having to buy their own carbon credits just to support the price. And that whole mechanism fell flat. So until the macro markets are affected, um, in a fundamental and systemic way. Unfortunately, our individual activities will result in greater awareness in the next generation. And hopefully, you know, the kids coming through the system with this greater awareness will change the way society runs on a fundamental basis. Um, which is why environmental insurance is so important. Because what it starts to do is it starts to give investors and providers of long-term financial capital the kind of, of comfort that these issues are taken care of. And it's really money well spent and it's appropriate and it's the right thing to do. Um, we, um, you know, we're really encouraging um, our clients to look at this from, you know, the long-term responsibility of making sure that as we benefit from handling hazardous materials in society, as we make our profits off chemicals and fuels and other things that are potentially harmful, that we also put in place the correct mechanisms to safeguard uh, the natural systems on which we depend. Thanks, James. There's a question, yeah, there's yeah, a question here. Please. Justin, are you okay if I just run through these questions? Yeah, you, you run through You go for it, yeah. Thanks. Patrick West has asked, would mining rehab guarantees in your site safe product Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for that question, Patrick. Um, we've actually, um, on Monday, we got the first approval from NURSA for a large gas company where our mining, um, our mining product um, has been accepted in lieu of a mining re-up guarantee. And if you correctly apportion those liabilities from the financial guarantee into a large product being a third-party exposure, one can potentially free up tens of millions, if not billions in some cases, um, of rands from uh, stagnant balance sheets from these mining companies tied up in these financial guarantees and rather put them to work in creating jobs and expanding operations. Um, you know, at best, these mining guarantees can only offer money market returns at 9%. But if one can free up these balance sheets to give, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, proper returns on equity closer to 20, 30 percent what investors are expecting. That'll be beneficial to your clients in the, in the short term. Um, Jovan Rensberg asks about recent bushfires in Cape Town. Um, 
sustained air pollution presence, presenters see the COVID-19 lockdown, potential effect, lessening potential for fires to start. Um, sure, I, I haven't seen any research on bushfires. Um, yeah, I mean, the bushfires are largely, um, you know, on a macro level linked to climate change, especially the ones in Australia and also changes in clearing of, of, of bush cover, of ground cover. I think that's quite a complex um, issue. I don't see COVID-19 as really changing that much. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if there's much more I can say on that. Um, but bushfires certainly do have a, a significant effect on greenhouse gases. It's estimated that at any given point in Africa has, uh, as a continent, has over 700 fires um, raging that you can see from planes flying over the continent at any given time. Um, that said, bushfires are important ways of transporting nutrients because obviously the bushfires release um, mineral matter, um, inorganic uh, particulates into the atmosphere, which are then spread by winds. Um, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, the winds going off the Sahara is the largest source of nutrients into the west, into the Atlantic, off the west coast of Africa. And satellite photos show how these dust storms fall into the ocean, carrying vital nutrients for those for those ecosystems there in the ocean. Anna asks, asks about the shark fins. Um, do you know if this environmental research working closely with helping? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what the question is. Do you know if this environmental research is also working closely with helping animal creature protection groups around the world? I'm not sure which, which um, environmental research you're referring to. Um, Okay, what's I2's position? I2's position on sawtooth roofing and banks requesting guarantees um, from building owners and gradual asbestos pollution. It's a very interesting question. Simon Griffiths, thanks for that. Unfortunately, as a result of the research, absolute exclusions on asbestos-related claims across the board. Um, you know, this is a question of policies catching up with science um, and. Um, yeah, you know, but one of the big concerns we have as insurers, obviously, is that, you know, we're playing catch up as science reveals something, um, you know, being hazardous, then we've got to adjust our policies. Um, I know there was an issue on carte blanche the other night about insurers not covering, uh, you know, introducing absolute exclusions and not um, on COVID um, for their renewals. Um, but yes, asbestos is completely excluded at this stage. Um, and I don't see that changing. Um, Fiona Thompson mentioned the hazardous products in a truck set. The effect of milk spillage. Yes, so not, not, not everything is as it seems. Um, things like vegetable oil and milk, if released into the environment, um, has a negative consequence on the receiving environment. Milk in particular, um, because of its, its high organic load, basically, the microbes in the water um, um, chew up all the available oxygen as they try and consume um, the milk in the water, and it effectively sterilizes um, any natural river system. Um, so, you know, something that might appear to be healthy for us because we drink it um, appears to it can be very toxic in a natural environment, just like fresh, clean water from a dam release can sterilize a river estuary, which is resulting on a saline, you know, which is dependent on a saline balance. Um, uh, and you, if you flood that with, with fresh deoxygenated water, that's effectively toxic to that receiving estuary. Um, um, CPD points. Ah, Charlene, this product is a lot like EnviroSure. What makes i2 better? Well, two main things um, that we um, don't um, we don't um, exclude pre-existing pollution. So, if you look at EnviroSure's policy, for example, um, their um, all their policies um, run from their inception date, and they exclude historic pollution. Our policies don't. So regardless of when the pollution occurred, um, we will be good for the cover. Um, 
even if it started occurring prior to the inception date, which is really important for things like underground storage tanks, pipelines, sumps, factories, warehouses, um, where these pollution effects might be occurring gradually over time. Um, the second main benefit that we have over our competitors is that we offer true third-party lives. So we can cover, and we do cover, you know, third-party business interruption, bodily injury, increased cost of working, property damage, whereas our competitors just offer the cleanup itself. Um, so we offer the cleanup, but we also cover all of the third-party damages, which in many cases can exceed the actual cost of cleanup. Um, Charlene, I hope that one answers that. Uh, Abay Majora asks more detail on MindSafe, a couple of few examples how it would respond. Um, yeah, so um, we are currently, in fact, I just got the renewal this morning, um, starting from the 1st of June. We, we are underwriting, for example, some tailings dams down close to the Kruger Park where, you know, existing known pollution is going into the Salati River which is going into the Oliphants River, which is going right past the Kruger Park. And we're covering not only the dams from a sudden and accidental collapse of the dam, but also from the gradual pollution that is seeping through into the groundwater and might affect downstream water users. We've designed a bespoke policy to cover the client with certain thresholds and limits um, and manage to secure reinsurance capacity for this. I think it just speaks to what Justin was saying about how you know, our expertise in these fields result, relies, results in us being able to offer bespoke solutions according to time, place, and circumstance. Carol, thanks very much. Julia, thank you for that. Um, yes, Anna. Anna, if you're ever looking for a job, we're hiring an ERL in, <laughs> at, at I2. It's like, this seems very close to your heart. Um, governments have to enforce these laws to protect our planet countries. Yes, but I also want to stress the importance of informal regulators, namely the communities living around your clients. So what we have in South Africa is unfortunately because of our prominence of, of informal townships and poorer members of society, there's been a severe encroachment of our communities closer and closer to industrial areas. So what we have now is we have sensitive receptors, namely elderly, children, you know, people, families living right next to factories. And the land, you know, the urban land use planning, the town planning should have separated these, but because people are desperate to be closer to their sources of work, you're running the risk of community health effects as a result of people living right next to factories and industrial areas, and that just heightens the risk. Um, so yes, unfortunately, enforcement is lax, and that gives rise to these types of challenges. Um, Justin, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, it's Guys, great. thanks. Okay. Yeah. I think um, time is pretty much up, pretty much up. and answer all the, all the questions. So thank you so much, James, for a really interesting chat today, and thank you big time for all of our brokers and friends that have listened in. Um, so I think that brings us to the end, um, but we'd really like to say thanks and, and please support um, our environmental liability business and James is more than happy to have discussions with you and your clients if we can help you convince them that they need this sort of cover or as James said to, to put in place bespoke solutions. So if you want to say cheers um, or put your video on.